Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See detail. This episode is brought to you by Ring Cameras and Doorbells. A lot happens while you're away from home. That's why Ring makes it easy to check in from anywhere. Whether you're saying hi to an unexpected guest, making sure those packages are safe, or keeping your pets company while you're out grabbing groceries. It's all a few taps away, right from your phone. Be there with Ring. Explore cameras, doorbells, alarm kits, and more right now at ring.com. Welcome, everybody, to this week's podcast episode for the Financial Freedom for Physicians podcast. And I'm your host, Dr. Christopher Liu. And as we talk about four different pillars of freedom, time, financial, location, emotional freedom. And today we have a uh, physician guest on our show, um, Dr. Anjani, and uh, she's going to talk to us all about physician advisory, uh, different alternative income streams, and different roles that you can be as a physician. So Anjani, welcome. Thank you for having me, Chris. You as well have a very inspiring story. And thank you for having me here. And uh, today to our listeners, I have three takeaway points. Uh, First one is hope, even when everything is falling apart in your life. The second one is networking to build your life back up. And the third one is empathy to give back something to the community when your cup is full. So these three values were taught to me by my father very early in my childhood. And they're my greatest gifts. And today I'm willing to share all these beautiful gifts with your listeners as we unfold my journey. Excellent. So yeah, I love that. I love those principles and those takeaways. So tell us more about your I've heard your story and then share with listeners. Tell us how you came to be where you are. So I was born and raised in India. I lost my father very young at age 12. And that's when I decided I wanted to become a doctor and nothing else. Before that, I had all kinds of crazy kid ideas. I want to be this. I want to be that. And and I worked very hard towards going to medical school in India. Towards the end of my medical school, I also came to the United States, did my fourth year medical school school rotations here, which are called electives. Went back, graduated in India, came back, did my internal medicine residency in Michigan, and then graduated from there in 2015. So when I was in internal medicine residency, I was on a J-1 visa, which required to me to do the three-year waiver program in order to continue my stay in the United States. So I had to go to Iowa to do that uh, waiver program in an underserved place in Iowa, and I finished those three years after which I was a hospitalist there. After which, again, I moved to Pennsylvania as a hospitalist in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And the 26th of uh, November, 2019 was like a life-changing event for me. I was uh, walking towards the emergency room to admit one of my patients and I had a terrible fall. I was a rapid response immediately and I was taken into the emergency room. And the only way I could walk out that day evening was on crutches. And uh, I went home on crutches. I was all by myself. I couldn't use the restroom. I couldn't take a shower. I couldn't get onto the bed. And uh, up until then, I was a hospitalist who could do 20 shifts straight and not feel tired. And walking those 20 steps in my apartment was very difficult for me. And as you can see, I talk so fast and I'm a chatterbox. And I lived inside my apartment for almost one year and uh, the silence was like so deafening and I couldn't do the duties of hospitalist anymore. And I exhausted my FMLA, exhausted my short-term disability. And I was let go as a hospitalist after about six months, summer of 2020. And uh, that's when my actual journey started where I had to look for some job that would be in good alignment with my healing phase with my injuries and allow me to give a desk job. So that's when like the physician advisor role and looking for them and working towards getting that role started. Very, it's a very inspiring story from injury back to where you are. And I know you wanted to 
share your thoughts on physicians in, interested in physician advisory roles. So tell us more about that. So physician advisor is uh, mostly, it could be done remote, but it depends on the system, uh, what they prefer. They want an on-site or they could be remote. Again, it, it comes in two different packages, whether you want to be a physician advisor associated with the hospital or you want to be a medical director associated with the insurance company. It's two sides of the coin. The patient is the common center, whether you're working for the hospital or you're working for an insurance company. Most, most of the times, I feel like the specialties with a backdrop of EM and uh, IM do fairly relatively well as opposed to pediatrics and psychiatry because we have way more uh, system-based approach and we understand how all the other departments work. Um, however, other departments can catch up. It's not very difficult. The understanding of the system-based practice helps you a lot more to get into the physician advisor role. And I would say that taking the boards for physician advisor is also a step that is important and it adds to your resume in order to get these uh, kind of roles. Also, it helps you understand a lot of rules. Medicare has a lot of rules that you have to know and you can learn them on the job. It's not that you do not learn them. Uh, however, having that uh, under your belt as a board certification, which is probably going to give you double, triple board, depending on how ambitious you are, that helps as well. So I think it, as a non-clinical career, this is one of the very nice careers to choose. It's a bridge between leadership and physicians. So when you're in that bridge space, it really, like I actually get to see how the revenues flow. I have a very good re relationship with, with physicians. I know what the expectations of leader leadership is, and I know how the insurance companies work so you get to see a variety of things and you can always choose okay do I want to like maybe uh, advance in this way or that way what do I want to actually do do I really have those leadership skills what are my strengths what are my weaknesses you're able to get out of that box of being a physician to face physician advisor and actually having that vision that becomes like more of 360 degrees, which I did not know that I would have that much vision when I initially took up that role. But after taking that role, I'm like, I just started looking around and I'm like, wow, I know so much more than I knew as a physician. So it's a very nice role. It's, uh, it's really, I would uh, encourage anybody to take it. I had a reason, my injury. However, if you are burnt out in your job, you have a sick child, sick parent, people go through a lot of things, health issues, mental health issues, so many things. It's a way, it's a nice way to step back sometimes. Again, stepping back is not actually stepping back because I described how much this role offers for you um, in terms of how much vision you get. Yeah, that's quite interesting. What are uh, some of the skills you need to become a physician advisor? Great question. So like I said, you know, having internal medicine or hospitalist or EM really helps you have that kickstart. However, you can learn all of that pretty quick as well. But I think you have to be really curious to learn because unlike up to date, there's not much available for physician advisors. You might sometimes get stuck in. That is very important um, to like be curious to learn. And uh, I would personally say build relationships with physicians. Building relationships with physicians helps you just smoothen out your workflow so much. Uh, when I had to take up this role, I was I entered a huge system. I had to change it to a different hospital, a 600 bed hospital, new face. Nobody knew who I was. So it was very important to build that relationship with physicians. And how did I do it was I took the initiative of presenting to the big guns of the hospital who bring the biggest income to the hospital, which is surgery, pediatrics, internal medicine, trauma. I know you're ortho in my hospital. Ortho mainly goes to internal medicine or to trauma in terms of admissions. We foc I focused on these big guns and it's all about telling them the why. When they know the why, Chris, why do we do this? Why is utilization management important? Why is it important to stick with Medicare guidelines? What happens when you don't stick with Medicare guidelines? How does it affect the revenue? We show them the graphs. If we do, this is what happens. If we do, this is what happens. And how does patient satisfaction score get affected when you don't do something the way it has to be done? As a, for example, saying the 
right status. Now the patient gets discharged in an incorrect status, gets a big bill and says, hey, I never knew about this bill. So now they're upset. Now that's not the right way to deal with it once the patient is discharged. So once the physicians know the why, they work with you so beautifully. So it's a lot of front-end work, I would say, for a physician advisor to do. And not only the front-end work, because when you work in a very big system, it's a revolving door. We constantly have new PAs or new physicians, and then we just had July incoming residents. So, you know, it's constantly educating. So you have to be willing to like really like, you know, take up educating uh, yourself and the physicians as like pretty much a daily job. It's like you're constantly learning. So I think that is one other tip I would say that you have to be willing to learn. You have to be willing to teach and uh, you have to be willing to genuinely build those relationships and be available uh, for the people. So I would say and just appreciate the physicians like they are literally stopping what they're doing to put in that order for you. So I'm very thankful when they do that. And uh, so I think like the, the work flows when you're like able to build relationships really well. And fortunately, we have very good utilization management nurses. So they make our life so much more easy and a lot of like back end work of setting up these peer to peers and like looking up the criteria is done by them. So it makes my life like very easy. Yeah, I love that. <clears throat> the networking is key for everything. And yes, it is. It is. Yeah. I know some of a lot of the listeners are interested, either they're burnt out or they just you know, like it's and how would what's a day like in the life of a physician advisor to describe it to us? Great. Again, I can speak from where I'm coming from. Like I work in a 600 bedded hospital, which is like huge. So I shuffle between the 600 bedded hospital for two weeks and we have five satellite hospitals. The bed range is anywhere between 20 to 60. So I actually have a variety of cases and varieties of intensities that I see. So when you work in a 600 bedded hospital, like you're literally like very busy. Those two weeks are going to be busy. The inter interactions, number of interactions with the utilization management nurses or the physicians is going to be extensive. So when you're in a lighter hospital, again, like it, it decreases, but you have other kinds of challenges it depends on because there are transfers out and um, then you have to know what you're doing with the transfer, what status. So I would say if you're looking at a particular number of cases that you end up seeing with these kind of uh, senses, I would say if you're going for a tertiary hospital, you will see anywhere between 25 and 30 cases easy and that also with comes with all those interactions that you have to have with the teams during the whole day and when you're coming to the smaller hospitals it can range anywhere between 15 to 20 20 is an average i would say because we have five satellite hospitals and it depends each system has a different way of dealing with all these cases we have epic and the cases automatically get pulled into EPIC, uh, depending on the number of hours and the type of insurance. So that makes our life easy. Every physician who is assigned to a particular hospital is just working through their work queues and finishing up their cases. Again, like I said, my utilization management nursing team is just excellent. So there are certain cases that don't get pulled in uh, automatically. So they actually punch them in if there's a denial or if there is something that needs to be done, which is not, which Epic doesn't catch. So they put them into the work queue or they sometimes text us depending if they're not able to put it in the work queue. So we take care of that. Again, it's how well you work with the utilization management nurses. If you have one in your hospital, your day becomes like really smooth or <laughs> really rough. I never had a rough day because I really love them and you know, it's very easy to work with them. This is usually the typical day. You have an eight hour day. Usually most of the UN places are Monday through Friday, eight to four. It's relatively smooth until you have an escalation, which probably happens just once or twice a year. Something goes like terribly wrong, but it's just very rare. Trust me. You will not have things like rapid responses or people coding on you. Nothing of that kind. Uh, yeah, that's such an interesting um, area. And I know a lot of um, physicians are getting into this area. It's been a really very popular. I know there's conferences on becoming a physician advisor, um, what are some resources that uh, physicians can go and learn more about this uh, role that they can play? 
American College of Physician Advisors is a good place. You can start looking up there. And ABQ, AURP is like a really good place. You can start, that's the board. You can start looking up things there. And I think I literally like live, crawl on LinkedIn. Anybody who is a physician advisor some, posts something, I learn immediately. There, there are so many people who post, Dr. Hirsch, for example, like he posts all these things. And sometimes I really don't have the time to read up something. So that one post teaches me one point. Maybe sometimes I don't know. Or or Dr. Mullins, like he, he like makes these wonderful five minute videos, right? Like I just go watch a video and I learn something new. So I'm like, okay, this is done. So I think you could use all these resources depending on how much time or how little time you have. And um, again, I don't, uh, I have to be honest. I don't do it every day. Once I, when I'm scrolling through LinkedIn, I definitely you know, okay, do I know this or I don't, I know this. If I don't know something, I will pay attention. If I know it, like I'm like, ah, I know it. So. Yeah. It's been a wonderful conversation. Um, and I know um, a lot of viewers and listeners would be interested in visiting you, contacting you. How can they do that? I am, uh, like I said, I literally live on LinkedIn. So you could uh, reach me out on LinkedIn. My message option is open to everybody. So you could uh, reach me out on LinkedIn and I'll be sure to reply to you. Whether it's a question on how this role is or the boards, whatever it is, feel free to reach out to me. Yeah. And any last minute parting words of advice or any words of motivation, inspiration? Great. So uh, for me, I feel inspiration would be, like I said, I was injured. I had a really bad time in that one, one and a half years where I was stuck in my apartment. I was somebody who was like running at 100 miles per hour, traveling all over the world, doing hospitalists. That time was a time like I realized, oh my God, you need social support. You need to understand healthcare. Like being a physician, like navigating through this maze of healthcare was very tough for me. And unexpectedly earlier this year, a door opened for me to serve as a volunteer and also as a, a board member now in um, uh, my community. We are a nonprofit called Partners for Healthy Community. And what we actually do is we uh, sit down with senior citizens in our community and teach them how to use technology, like whether it is listening a song on YouTube or seeing their beautiful grandchildren on a video call or even doing a, a Zoom call to see their doctors online. They had no idea how to do these online appointments. And we catch up. We are young. We catch up with all these technology. They had no idea how to do it. So for me, I had a lot of gratification doing that because it was like, oh my God, I know the loneliness. I know the lack of social support I could relate to them and this is also this also like I said physician advisor gave me insight into how the healthcare system works where the insurance companies are looking at value-based care and also providing care in appropriate settings so when I do my nonprofit work I am looking at social determinants of health. So why not the healthcare and insurance companies invest in our communities where we build healthier communities and whatever we all talk about, bringing down the healthcare costs would automatically come down uh, when we are like investing in our community. So that is something uh, which is very inspiring to me. Again, I want to work towards that. I want to form that bridge eventually between the healthcare and the insurance companies and encourage everybody to invest in the communities. So that's my vision, big vision, but we'll get there someday. Yeah, that's so inspiring. And Johnny, thanks for so much for coming onto the podcast. I know the a lot of listeners will draw inspiration and knowledge and wisdom from your expertise and your experience. So thanks so much. And we look forward to hearing about your future success. Thank you so much, Chris, for having me again. Thank you.